In this lecture, we're going to talk about the genetic code. The genetic code is, is an exciting topic and, and something that we haven't known about for that long, relatively speaking, uh, as humans. Uh, we can go back uh, to the 1950s and to a point in time when, when we didn't understand the genetic code. And so the genetic code ties directly into to what we've talked about so far in this particular um, chapter. And the genetic code explains how we actually read DNA. It's really quite an amazing um, story, and it ties into all sorts of other things that we've talked about in our class, and it's extremely important um, to you in, in your life, as we'll illustrate here in just a moment. So you know that everything about you is written in your DNA, but the question is, how do you read it? Uh, because when you look at DNA, there are only four bases, as you know, in DNA. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, A, T, C, and G. So at one point, not so long ago, I had a gene sequenced. I had a, a, a friend who's a professor of genetics, and he needed someone that has red hair. And as you noticed in the actual videos I've done with the picture, um, or I guess my photos on Discovery there, I have red hair. And so uh, I had a gene uh, sequenced, and it was the melanocortin receptor gene. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later in the class. I think I've mentioned it uh, in previous lectures. And so we got the sequence back, and if you look at the sequence, then what you're looking at are lines and lines and lines of these letters that represent bases. Imagine an 8.5 by 11 sheet of, of typical printer paper, single spaced, and pretend that you just took that and you typed A, T, T, C, G, A, T, T, C, and just not a space at all between the letters and not a space between the lines but just letter after letter after letter. That's the, the sequence of one particular gene in your body. And so when you look at that, you, you, you know, a legitimate question is, what does it mean? I, I mean, what that makes to the average person, that would mean nothing at all. You have thousands of ATT, CG, ATC. You know, and, and so the, the question becomes, how do we interpret that? And, and how does that become valuable to us? So remember, th this may be a little disturbing, but based on these discussions that we've had very recently related to current events, it's that sequence that led Angelina Jolie to take those steps that she took. It was simply based on that sequence. Nothing more than that sequence led her to do that. And so the sequence of those bases is extremely important um, to, to all of us. It determines what we look like and it determines our susceptibility to these various diseases as we go through life. We, we've really overplayed this um, important, the, the role of DNA in, in causing diseases. Now that, that's certainly important to human health, but everything about you is encoded by that DNA. There, there's not a, a single aspect uh, about your physical uh, being, whether that's the, the interaction of neurons in your brain or, or the color of your skin or your height or your ear shape, it's not encoded in that sequence of, of bases in your DNA. So what we want to talk about now is how you read that. And this is something that took us as humans a while to figure out. For a long time, we were hung up on this idea. Well, for a long time, we didn't know what the genetic material actually was. And there were two, it came down to, to two candidates. It, it could have been amino acids or, or it could have been DNA. And we weren't sure what actually carried the, the genetic material. It you know, took us a, quite a while to, to figure this out. And the proponents of the idea that protein was the genetic material had this going for them. So ask yourself this question, how many amino acids are there in proteins? You know that proteins are chains of amino acids. As a, a brief quiz for our class here, um, how many amino acids do we have that make up proteins? I'll tell you the answer in just a moment. Do you know the answer? All right, so here's the answer. The answer is 20. So there are 20 different amino acids that make up proteins. And how many bases are there that are found in DNA? And of course you know the answer is four. And so it seems very logical, doesn't it, that if you're going to spell out this complex code that determines everything about the phenotype of an organism, that you would use an alphabet that has 20 different letters, so to speak, in it. In other words, 20 different uh, amino acids in the case of proteins that you could arrange into different orders to, to specify different characteristics of an organism. It doesn't make much sense that you would choose an alphabet that has four letters, four bases in the form of DNA. But in, the fact that you, but in fact, as you 
obviously know the genetic code is DNA and here's how that works the four bases are not many there's not many things many ways to arrange those four bases but the trick is this those bases are arranged into sets of three that we refer to as codons um, and so that's the idea of codon that we mentioned in that translation lecture when the the DNA is read or you know the DNA is turned into RNA and so when the RNA uh, is read it's read in these these sets of three bases referred to as codons and if you take those th three codons and put them together in every possible um, arrangement um, so you well the codon is a set of three you've got four bases to to make these codons then there's 64 possible codons 61 of these code for amino acids there are three others that are stop codons but I, I don't want you to lose sight of the big picture here so so the big breakthrough the thing that took us a while as humans to figure out was this that we're not reading just one base at a time that wouldn't have worked at all um, and that's why everyone thought no one realized there was any other possibility and so that's why people thought that protein must be the genetic material but that's not the case so the key is codons you read three bases at a time um, now it says three nucleotides but that makes sense to you at this point because you realize that a nucleotide is composed of a sugar a phosphate and a base the sugars and the phosphates are always exactly the same but it's the base that varies um, and so this idea of codons then allows us to actually read the DNA and, and to put together lots of, of different combinations that can spell out everything about the phenotype uh, of an organism. And you know, it even goes beyond just the, the difference in, say, a person that has red hair and blonde hair. I mean, you realize that the combination of these bases, you know, when you put these together, it, there's no difference. One of the big ideas in biology is that there's no difference in the DNA between one organism and another. It's the same, the DNA is the same in bacteria as it is in fungi, as it is in uh, humans, and, and as it is in trees. And so <clears throat> it's amazing to think about, uh, to me at least, and, and I think it is, would be to anyone. So, I mean, imagine this when you put the DNA in, together in a certain way, then you get a little lizard. So I, you see lots of lizards this time of year during the summer. Uh, I saw a fence lizard recently, little, you know, a little six inch long organism. But you put the DNA together in a different way and you get a dinosaur. You, you get a Tyrannosaurus rex, this, this monster dinosaur that we all know what they look like if we've uh, seen various um, uh, movies and, and looked at pictures and so forth uh, of, of reconstructed uh, models of what these things look like but but it's all about the DNA I mean literally that is the difference between a little lizard and a, and a huge dinosaur it's a difference between a gigantic oak tree and uh, a little blade of grass I mean DNA spells out that that code spells out everything um, it's incredibly complex I mean you have to remember there are billions of these bases that are found in the DNA of organisms um, and it spells out everything about them and, and it spells out things that you know are not immediately obvious either there, there's a very interesting aspect uh, that we observe in nature that animals age at different rates and so if we look at something like a, a mouse even if you took a mouse I saw a little mouse yesterday um, when I was moving some boards and, and there's this little gray mouse out in the field and if you took that little mouse th this was a wild mouse out in, in uh, oh, far away from uh, it wasn't a house mouse um, which is a actual common name of a species of mouse if you took it and you gave it the best possible care, it would only live about five years. It would not live longer than five years. But if you took the same size uh, bat, not that you should do this, uh, as they carry rabies, but if you gave that bat the best possible care, it would potentially live 15 or 20 years. And, and so amazingly, animals age at these different rates. If you take a, a box turtle, which doesn't get much bigger than that mouse, a little bigger, then that thing can live 120 years. So incredibly, even the aging process uh, is spelled out in the DNA. Now that's very complex, um, de determining what, you know, all the different things that, I'm not saying there's one gene certainly that determines aging, but there's no question that the aging process is, is spelled out in the DNA. So the point I'm trying to make is that, that this code is, is quite amazing, and what we're talking about now is deciphering this code. All right, so here we have the genetic code all spelled out uh, for us. Now, 
this table is going to be important to you. You will uh, be given this table uh, on some uh, quizzes and uh, some, uh, well, you'll just have to refer to this table in the notes. Um, remember, we're, of course, working from the Chapter 9 notes. This is, this is from your text. You can look at it in your text as well. Um, as you do, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this week's um, exercise, genetic exercise, and um, this is a, a table that shows us the combination of all these uh, 64 codons that exist and the amino acids that they code for. Now you know that there are 20 amino acids and there are 61 codons that code for amino acids and so you realize that multiple codons must code for the same amino acid. Now how do we use the table then? And so this, it's quite simple to use the table. Let's say that we want to uh, look at a, a particular codon. So let's say we, we see the codon CCA and we want to know what that what amino acid is specified by that codon. And you'll be asked to do this. This is quite simple um, in that, uh, for instance, exercise this week. And so if the first thing we do is start in the left hand side and so this says first base and so we have CCA. That's the codon we want to find. And so here, and I'm pointing with a little pointer as you'll notice, here on the left hand side we find C second base for the second base we go to the top of this table and so the second base is also C so now we have C and C so we are restricted now to this little um, box of uh, codons here now I realize you can see CCA right there but if you, you want to use this third base um, column then you're welcome to do that as well and so you're already restricted, you know, to this little box, and so if you go over here, the last base is either U, C, A, or G. And so the last base in this case is A, so we go right back across here and we have C, C, A. And so now we know that the codon C, C, A codes for proline. Proline is one particular amino acid. And so we could find any amino acid using this uh, little table. So you live at a pretty amazing time in history. Throughout most of human history, uh, until uh, very recently, 60 years ago, we didn't. This information was not available. If you'd lived 100 years ago and come up with this, actually, if you'd lived 100 years ago and come up with this, no one would have known what you were talking about. But but if you had lived 70 years ago and come up with this, then you could be world famous now because you would have cracked this genetic code. Um, but this is provided for you in just a very introductory class now. It's quite simple, but it took us a while to figure out um, as humans. And so this is how your DNA and your phenotype uh, came about. The, your DNA was read. It was made into amino acids uh, in this particular manner and put together. Your proteins have a certain characteristic, and so you look a certain way. Now, let's go back uh, as an, an example to my... Um, the gene that I had sequenced. And so I had my melanocortin receptor sequenced um, by my friend who's a, a genetics professor. And uh, I've mentioned this before, but it's that mutation in my melanocortin receptor that gives me red hair. Um, my melanocortin receptor uh, brings about the production of melanin that's not shaped the same way that the melanin uh, is shaped in someone that has dark hair and dark skin. I have a little niece who's adopted from Guatemala and she has dark hair um, and uh, dark skin and so her melanin is different uh, than my melanin as a result of the fact that the sequence of bases in her melanocortin receptor is different uh, as is everyone else on the face of the earth who has dark hair uh, and dark skin and so when I use the word mutation that brings about this uh, fear of uh, strange characteristics and, and bad things but in reality uh, that mutation is something that's shared by um, everyone that has red hair. Um, and th there are different, slightly different mutations that bring about slightly different types of red hair. Um, but also people that have blonde hair have a different type of, of mutation. And sandy hair is a different type of mutation. Everyone that doesn't have the, the pure melanin has some sort of variation. Perhaps variation would be a, a better term, although mutation is the one that's actually used in science. But uh, variation might be a less alarming term to use to describe that sequence of bases found in the genes that code for melanin. Um, and I'm saying melanin, M-E-L-A-N-I-N, -E melanin. Melanin is the protein that provides our skin and hair and nails with pigment. Um, we all have melanin unless we're, we uh, suffer from albinism, but we have different types of melanin. 
So this table then is what you need to know to interpret the genetic code. Um, a couple other things we want to mention regarding this table. Remember that we have said there are 64 codons and 61 of those code for amino acids. Three of them do not. Three of them are what we call stop codons. We saw the importance of stop codons in the translation lecture. Um, that's the last lecture in the sequence uh, for this particular chapter. The, the last, the one that directly precedes this lecture. So UAA, UAG, and UGA are all stop codons. And stop codons do not introduce an amino acid into a growing protein as you saw in that video uh, animation in the, la in the translation lecture. You don't have to memorize this table of course or even remember what the stop codons are but you do need to, to recognize um, the role that stop codons play. You also need to recognize the role that a start codon plays and so AUG as I mentioned in that translation lecture is, it, is it the, it's not A, it's the only one, it's the start codon. Now it's included in those 61 codons that specify amino acids because methionine is the amino acid that's introduced as a result of the sequence AUG. And so you realize at this point then, based on that information, that every single protein in your body begins with the amino acid methionine. Methionine is the first amino acid in every single uh, protein that's found in your body. So given this information then, you could take a, a sequence um, of DNA and come up with the amino acid, the chain of amino acids um, that will be produced as a result of this particular sequence. And remember, it's, it's the amino acids that actually matter. It's the amino acids that form the protein and it's those proteins that are going to do things like make a different type of melanin, uh, which means that you have red hair instead of black hair.